Praise God. We're back today in uh, John chapter 15. We started the last broadcast with that. If you happen to see that, I shared with you that in John chapter 15, the Lord has really given me an outline of a revival church. It came at a time when I was calling out to God and asking him to show me what a revival church would look like. So we would see in our spirit, know what the vision was, what we were pursuing. And the Lord just opened up to me, John chapter 15. And, and in there, there were several elements of a revival church. A revival church is a church that's plugged in to the true vine. A revival church is a, a church that's been purged and is it prepared to bring forth fruit. A revival church is a church that's clean through the word of God. A revival church is a church that's abiding in him. A revival church is a church where the word of God abides in them. A revival church is a church that asks what they will and God does it. The prayers are answered powerfully. A revival church is a church that is glorifying the Father by bearing much fruit. A revival church is a church that's full of joy. A revival church is a church that loves one another, even as Jesus loved us. And so I've been looking through John chapter 15 in the last couple of months here at, at the church where I passed the River of Life. I'm just kind of sharing some of that with you as we go on. And I want to pick up today at uh, John chapter 15, verse number 2. It says, every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. Every branch that beareth fruit, he purgeth it, that it may bring forth more fruit. The first part of that verse I want to talk about for just a little bit this day. This day. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. Let me repeat that again. Listen to that very close. He says, every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. I've often shared with people that there's a great deal of practical wisdom in that verse right there. I've used that in many ways in my own life. I'm a kind of a hyperactive person and I kind of feel like I got to do this and I got to do this and I got to do this and I got to do that. And one of the things that I fought over my several years here in ministry is I like to get too busy sometimes. I think I've got to do this and I've got to get involved in this and I've got to get involved in that. And the next thing you know, I'm looking around and thinking, boy, I'm just out of time. I, I can't keep doing everything that I'm involved in right now. So I have to go through a refining, refining process. And so I have to look, okay, what are my activities right now are bearing fruit? Which one of my activities right now are not bearing fruit? Because the things that are bearing fruit in my life for the Father are things that I need to increase. Things that are not bearing fruit in my, in my life are things that I need to decrease or get rid of. So that's basically the wisdom the Father is sharing there. Why? Because I don't want to invest my time, my energy, and my resources into things that are not bearing fruit. And I want to increase the amount of time and, and energy and resources that I'm investing in things that are bearing fruit so we can see more fruit come forth from that. Um, after the time in my life when I, I've ran a couple different businesses, and I use that same policy there. If you can look at your business and maybe you're selling products, well, which one of your products are really doing well, and which ones are maybe meeting needs and, and, and bringing in a good profit? Maybe another product is not meeting needs, and maybe it's not bringing in profit. Maybe you're actually losing money on that one. Then it's obvious that you want to increase the product where you're meeting needs and, and, and increase your profit there, and get rid of the product where you're not. Not, uh, bringing in any kind of profit or not meeting any needs. Same principle, same wisdom. We can apply that very exact same wisdom to a church. You can look at a church and think, which one of our ministries are bearing fruit? Which one of our ministries are not bearing fruit? And then you know, okay, these ones that are not bearing fruit for the Father, we need to take away. These ones that are bearing fruit for the Father, we need to increase. Why? Again, because you don't want to be putting all of your resources, all of your energy, all of your time into something that's not bearing fruit. But you do want to put your resources, your time, and your energy into everything that is bearing fruit. So you can take the wisdom there that the Father is sharing, and you can apply that to almost anything in life. You see, beloved, we as believers, we are called to bear fruit. We are called to glorify the Father by bearing fruit. But this verse here tells us very plainly that that which is not bearing fruit, that branch that doesn't bear fruit, that the Father takes it away. So we got to ask ourselves that question, you know, exactly what is he talking about there? How can we understand that better in application to our own lives, to our own ministry, maybe to our own church, whatever it might be? One of the, the examples that always pops up at me is the nation of Israel. 
And God's very plain in the word of God that the nation of Israel is an example of one of those branches that was not bearing fruit. I, uh, many people refer, uh, refer quite often to the fig tree when Jesus was walking by the fig tree. And he cursed the fig tree because it wasn't bearing fruit, because it wasn't bringing forth fruit. And then they went into the temple, and that's where Jesus cleansed the temple. And as they're walking back, back by that particular tree, Peter draws Jesus' attention to it and says, Look, that, that tree that you cursed, it, it's died at the roots, it's shriveled up and died. Now you just think, boy, why did Jesus pick on that fig tree? Why did he just walk by and choose that particular fig tree to walk up to it, see it was not bringing forth fruit, and to curse it? And it became obvious to me as I began to dig into the Word of God that that's a prophetic action. That, that, that fig tree was the nation of Israel at that time. They weren't bearing fruit. And so he was demonstrating that particular verse, that every branch that not, does not bear fruit, the Father takes it away. As a matter of fact, later on in the book of Romans, it makes it very specific that that was the nation of Israel and that a principle being applied. It's told us that Israel was a branch that was broken off as a result of unbelief. Israel, the nation at that time, was a branch that was broken off because of unbelief. As a matter of fact, Romans chapter 11, verse 20 tells us because of unbelief, they were broken off. And we can look at that and we think, boy, that seems kind of... I mean, how could that happen? How could it be that, that, that Jesus was walking among that nation? And Jesus himself was right there. He was, he was healing the sick. I mean, blind eyes were opening. Deaf ears were opening. I mean, lame people were walking. He was performing miracles and, and, and multiplying food and, and, and just every imaginable miracle, raising the dead. And they were witnessing that, but yet it says that because of their unbelief. Now, how could you sit there and watch Jesus... And respond with unbelief. How could you see those miracles and how could you see all those things taking place and respond with unbelief? You see, the book of Romans is also very specific about what their problem was and why they responded with unbelief. See, it tells us they did have a zeal for God. The, the nation of Israel at that time had a zeal for God. They had a hunger for God and desire for God. But it says they were ignorant of God's righteousness. As a result of that, they were seeking to establish their own righteousness. You see the problem they had? They didn't have a problem believing Jesus was standing in front of them. They didn't have a problem necessarily believing that Jesus, they were witnessing Jesus doing the healings. They were witnessing Jesus doing the miracles and raising the dead. The problem they had was Jesus' plan for them to be righteous. Jesus' plan for them to be righteous was that he had to go upon the cross and die for their sins. He had to be buried and resurrected and ascended to the right hand of the Father. You see, as a matter of fact, when Jesus addressed them about such things, it said, they got offended and said, wait a second, we're not in bondage, we're children of Abraham. In other words, they could not see with their, uh, with their understanding their need for a Savior. They could not see with their understanding their need for Christ to die upon the cross for their sins. They thought they could be righteous in and of their own accord. Matter of fact, Jesus taught a parable in Luke chapter 18, verses 9 through 14, exactly dealing with that. He said in that parable that that parable was for those who trusted in themselves that they were righteous. For those who trusted in themselves that they were righteous. You see, he was confronting Israel with a simple message at that time. That their righteousness was not sufficient. That just like anybody else, they were sinners. And they needed a Savior. And he was that Savior. And he didn't come to necessarily to set them free politically or, or militarily. He came to set them free by dying on the cross for their sins. And being buried and resurrected unto the newness of life. You see, in that particular parable, it's a Pharisee and a tax collector. And the Pharisee and the tax collector are in prayer. And the Pharisee's walking around and patting himself on the back and, and talking about how wonderful he is and he's not an extortioner and he's not unjust and he's not an adulterer and he fasts twice a week and pays all of his tithes and patting himself on the back because he believed that because of those things that he was righteous in the eyes of God. But yet it also talks about the tax collector. And the tax collector is the one that's over there and he's crying out, Oh God, oh God, have mercy upon me. You see, because that Pharisee did not understand the righteousness of God, he thought he had to establish his own righteousness. 
You see, that's what Romans chapter 10 tells us, that they were ignorant of God's righteousness. So what is God's righteousness then? What were they ignorant of? Well, we understand that God's righteousness is very plainly told us in 2 Corinthians 5.21. For he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. God's righteousness or God's plan for mankind to be righteous was that he would send his son, he would die on the cross, be buried, resurrected, ascended to the right hand of the Father, and when he was upon the cross, he was literally taking our sins upon him. I, I always tell people, you know, that when Jesus was on the cross, he cried out, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And I, I always say that really disturbed me because I understand why. I know why God the Father had forsaken Jesus at that point in time. I know why there was a sense of separation in Jesus because our sins were placed upon him. He was dying and paying the price for our sins. And then we placed our faith in the death and the burial and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And that is God's plan for righteousness. That you and I become righteous as a result of the works of Jesus Christ. You see, I, I alluded to the, the tax collector who was there in that prayer meeting with the Pharisee. He's got God, have mercy upon me. And what he was doing, they understood exactly what they were saying when they said that. They were appealing to the mercy seat where the blood of, of, the, of the sacrifice was placed. You see, each and every day they were going forth and offering up sacrifices for their sins. But the Bible tells us in the book of Hebrews that Christ, when he came, he only went into the heavenly holy of holies and he put his shed blood on the heavenly mercy seat and that was only done one time because that was sufficient for mankind to be righteous before the eyes of God. You see, beloved, they were ignorant of God's righteousness. So they thought they had to go out and work hard to achieve their own righteousness. You see, the devil's not quit attacking people in that area. Another example, another illustration from the Word of God is the Church of Galatia. And the Church of Galatia was a church that Paul had went in and he had planted and they had a strong, thriving church there, but some people came in after him. And they were, were, they were legalizers, people who were teaching basically that, you know, kind of Paul got you started, but if you really want to go on with God, if you really want to mature with God, if you really want to be sanctified, you're going to have to start keeping the law. And they were trying to bring them into bondage again to the law. And there's a, a scripture that's it's kind of chilling if you really listen to it. It's Galatians chapter 1 verse 6. It says, I marvel that you are so soon removed from him who called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel. That's Galatians chapter 1 verse 6. But listen closely to what that verse says. That verse tells us there that because they were believing another gospel, they were removed from him. I marvel that you are so soon removed from him who called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel. So they're hearing this, these teachers, these false teachers who are coming in to bring them into bondage and bring them back into bondage to the law and as a result of believing that it says there that they are being separated or removed from him. I, I, every time I read that I, I remember a time in my own life and I shared this in many places of when I ministered and talked about it, there was a time in my life when I, I had been born again. I, was, I loved God. I was doing everything I knew to do to serve God. And I was going to church and I was hearing the Word and I was studying the Word. But all I except trying to do was trying to do it by my own effort. I was hearing the Word of God and I was hearing about how we were supposed to live and a consecrated life and a holy life and my heart desired that, my heart longed for that, but I didn't understand how to live that way, so I was trying to do it through self-effort. In a sense, it was almost had become a law to me and I, and I became a very miserable human being. And I remember very specifically because it was so vivid to me the time when I was driving, I was pouring my heart out to God and, and talking to the Lord. And it's like, Lord, I'm so miserable. I'm so miserable as a Christian. I don't know what to do. And, and I just, and I, not too long after that, I went and I was at my grandparents' house and I was standing and very vividly again, I remember looking out their kitchen window 
And as I was looking out the window, I felt God begin to tug at my heart. And it was just like I was lifting my eyes to Jesus again. Just as I did when I came to Christ for my salvation. I began to really put my faith upon Christ and crucified. And I felt the peace of God. I mean, the Spirit of God came over me and gave me such peace and such assurance that all I had to do was put my trust in Him. You see, beloved, as we lift up our eyes to Him and we put our faith in Him, that we understand that, that through Christ and Him crucified, that the Spirit of the living God comes down. He begins to empower us to live the Christian life. So we're walking by the Spirit and not by the flesh. When I'm trying to do it with my effort and my willpower and my strength and my self-effort, then I'm just trying to do it by the power of my flesh. But as I put my faith in Christ and Him crucified, the same way we do when we're born again, we live every day of our life looking for Christ to supply and empower us to live that Christian life. That's why Jesus Jesus, in the, in the rock in the wilderness, when the Israelites were complaining to Moses and griping at Moses, and Moses went to God because they were thirsty and didn't have any water, and God told Moses to hit the rock, and the water come gushing out. And it says later on in the book of Corinthians, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, that rock was Jesus, because we look by our faith to Christ and Him crucified, we look for Him to pour out His Spirit, and that river of the Holy Ghost to flow into our life, so we can walk out the, the, the life that God has called us into. It's not by self-effort. It, it's not by our strength or our willpower or where our way of doing things. It's through faith in Christ and Him crucified. And, and that is the source for everything in our life, beloved. There's a scripture in the book of Jeremiah where he talks about that his people had committed two evils. They had forsaken him, the fountain of living waters, and hewed out cisterns, broken cisterns that could hold no water. You see, beloved... That, that's just kind of like imagine your house is, it's got a hose running from a big water tank and there's another water tank right next to it that doesn't have any water in it, it's full of holes even if it had water put in it, it would just drain right out and you go out and you take that hose off of that water tank that's giving you such a full supply and you plug that hose into the water tank that's full of holes and doesn't have any water in it and you go in and you turn in the faucet and you wonder why in the world am I not getting any water why in the world what has happened to my water supply? You have taken that hose you have plugged into, you have taken it from the source of ample supply and put it on a source of no supply. And that's what we do when we take our faith off of Christ and Him crucified. We take that hose out of the, our source and our supply for all things and we put it into something, our own strength, our own ways, the world's ways, into something that can never give us a supply. You see, beloved, there's something in that, that chapter, Romans chapter 11, verse 21, that we need to be mindful of. And that verse, it says, Romans 11, 21, says, For if God spared not the natural branches, take heed, lest he also spare not thee. What does it mean to take heed? In other words, what I'm sharing with you that we're to, we're to look at, we're to give regard to. We are to look at the example of Israel, who was a branch that didn't bear fruit. As a result of that, of their unbelief, as a result of not bearing fruit, as a result of their ignorance of God's righteousness and not looking to their source of supply, who, supply, who was Christ and Him crucified, and not looking at that, then they began to, that, that branch was just dying. And beloved, that's what we've got to look at in our own life. Because if, we, if we're not plugged into Christ and Him crucified, if our faith is not locked into that 24-7, 365 days a year, then we're going to cut ourselves off from that source of supply. And we'll be cutting ourselves off from John chapter 15 tells us that Jesus is the true vine. So when we, when we take our faith, our eyes of faith, and we put it on something else, then that source of supply is, is interrupted. That flow of the river is interrupted. And that branch is going, to, is going to begin to shrivel and die and eventually begin to stop bearing fruit. You see, what I'm sharing with you here is so important. Our faith must absolutely be holy and completely and entrusted into Christ and Him crucified. We have to make sure that our altar is right and our altar is Christ and Him crucified. We have to, we have to make sure that we're, we are tapped into that full supply. I always go back many times and I, and I think of uh, Elijah, and many people are familiar with him, and Elijah... Uh, had a, so to speak, a showdown with the prophets of Baal. And he told them, you know, we're going to call out to our gods and we're going to have an offering here. And, and whosoever God answers with fire consumes that offering. <clears throat> we'll know that's the true God. And he had the prophets of Baal and he said, you guys can go first. And they cut themselves up and they howled and they carried on. 
And of course, it, there was no answer. Then Elijah came up, and when it was Elijah's time, the first thing it says Elijah did was he repaired the altar of the Lord that had been broken down. You see, beloved, it's, it's very easy in our lives for that altar to be broken down. It's very easy for us to get our eyes on something else. It's very easy for us to put our trust into something else. It's very easy for the enemy to do like he did at the church of Galatia and to get them where they're obeying the law and trying to do it that way. That's what happened, I believe, in the church of Corinth. That's why the Apostle Paul, when the Apostle Paul went there, he told him, I'm determined to preach nothing among you but Christ and him crucified. He was putting and rebuilding and restructuring that altar. So we have to ask ourselves the question, what kind of altars do we have in our life? Do we have altars that we're putting trust in? Do we have altars of false religion? Do we have altars of self-effort? Do we have altars of, of wealth? Do we have altars of, of, of any kind of family traditions, any kind of thing that we're putting our trust and our faith in? Or are we truly sick and say, you know what? I only have one altar in my life, and that altar is Christ and Him crucified. And that's where my eyes are. That's where my faith is. I understand that He is my source. This morning, I, uh, as I woke up early this morning and I was laying in bed just kind of praying for a moment and listening to the Lord, and, and, and for some reason the Lord really put it upon my heart. He showed me like somebody standing in a big field. And it was a farmer, and that field was dry, and that field was rocky, and that farmer was weeping because he hadn't seen anything come in. He didn't have any kind of harvest. And I understood the Lord was talking to me about exactly what I'm sharing with you. And maybe that's somebody out there, and you're thinking, boy, you know what? My, my field is hard, and, and my harvest is not coming in. But he was trying to show me that all you got to do is lift up your eyes to Jesus, because Jesus is that rock that pours out that water upon that field. And he's that rock that pours out that water upon that dry and thirsty field. And I'm just encouraging you today, as we come to a conclusion here in the teaching, just simply lift up your eyes, lift up your heart to Christ and him crucified. He is the supply for everything you'll ever need. He is the outpour of the Holy Spirit. He's your salvation. He's your deliverance. He's your healer. He's anything and everything that you need today. Call upon the name of the Lord. In Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Praise God. God is good. Yes, my sons and daughters, 
I can take your life that is broken and in shackles and ruins, and I can put it back together again. Believe in me, my children, believe. Believe that I am, and I say unto thee, I shall call unto thee, I shall speak with thee, I shall sit with thee. Open the door, my children, when I knock, open the door, let me in. And together we will rejoice forever and ever and ever. You shall be with me. You shall be my children and I shall be your father. I only say to you, my children, follow not the things of this world. Hear not the voice of the enemy. Oh, listen to me and know that it is I, the Lord thy God, that is speaking to you. Know that it is I, my children, for I give unto you things that are good. Only good gifts come from me. I say, take not things in this world. Because the world has nothing to offer for thee. The world is death unto thee. I say, come and choose me. For there is life, there is life, there is life. Yes, my children, I can take a broken heart and I can put it back together. I can take a frown and I can make a smile. I can take sorrow from you. And you shall once again feel joy and happiness. I say, worship me, my children, worship me. Think only in thoughts upon me, my children. Black out all the evil words that come from the enemy, because that is not for you. Only hear my voice, because my voice will lead you into glory. My voice will lead you into happiness. My voice will give you joy. My voice will give you peace. Yes, my children, peace I give unto thee. Peace forevermore. I say once again to you, peace forevermore. Praise God. I just like to read a scripture to you out of the book of Luke, chapter 6, verse 38. It says, Give, and it shall be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down and shaken together, and running over, shall men give unto your bosom. For with the same measure that you meet with all, it shall be measured to you again. The scripture very plainly tells us that as we give, as we give out of our heart, that God's going to return to us. And one of the keys to seeing the, the blessings of God in our life is giving into ministries. And I just want to share with you that you'll be given an opportunity opportunity at the end of this broadcast will be an address shown where you can send in offerings and we just we encourage you to just ask the Lord and ask God what he would have you to do to be part of this. We encourage you to be part of the vision of just taking the simplicity of God's word and proclaim it in the full power of the Holy Spirit to the world and we appreciate any and everything you do and God bless you. <laughs>